Okay, today we'll be talking about uh, corneal anatomy and physiology. So, uh, just as an overview of the basic structure of the cornea, uh, when we look at the size of the normal adult cornea, uh, it's a little bit longer horizontally than it is vertically. Uh, you can see there the normal size for the horizontal diameter of the cornea is about 11 to 12 millimeters and the vertical diameter about 9 to 11 millimeters. And that difference actually results from the scleralization that, uh, that happens uh, superiorly and inferiorly, uh, causing the diameter to be slightly larger in the horizontal meridian. Um, now, if you actually look at the cornea from the posterior surface, um, it, it actually does uh, complete a uh, completely round structure, uh, and so that difference is only uh, visible anteriorly. The thickness of the normal cornea uh, is about half a millimeter. Um, we say that the average is approximately 540 microns uh, centrally. Uh, and then, as you move towards the periphery of the cornea, uh, it actually gets thicker uh, and reaches a thickness of about uh, 0.7 millimeters. The curvature of the uh, normal cornea is actually aspheric, meaning that the curvature changes uh, throughout the surface of the cornea. Uh, it's actually greatest or steepest centrally. Uh, with a radius of curvature uh, about 7.5 to 8.5 millimeters uh, and that's within the 3 millimeter optical zone and then as it moves towards the periphery it does flatten out. Um, that aspheric uh, surface is important clinically when we look at things like spherical aberration uh, where different points on the cornea will actually have different focal points. Um, the power of the, corn, the normal cornea uh, is, ranges from about uh, 40 to 44 diopters in the normal cornea, uh, and it, it equals to roughly two-thirds of the power of the eye. Um, now, as we'll talk about a little bit later, um, this power is produced mostly at the air tear film interface, and that's because of the difference in refractive indices at that interface. This is just a, a summary outline of the, the overall structure of the cornea, going from anterior to posterior, starting with the tear film and the different layers of the tear film, and then the different histologic layers of the cornea. If we look at optics, um, like I mentioned before, the refractive power of the cornea is determined primarily by the tear film uh, and also by the anterior and posterior curvatures um, and all the different interfaces uh, between the, the various uh, tissues and layers of the cornea. Like we said, it's approximately 40 to 44 diopters. And below here we can see different refractive indices of, of the various tissues that make up uh, the going from the outside air all the way to the aqueous. Uh, if you look at it, you can see that uh, air is, uh, has a refractive index of 1. And then the tear film, the cornea, and the aqueous all have refractive indices that are roughly the same. And so that explains why uh, the most power, uh, or the most refractive power of the cornea actually comes uh, between the air tear film interface. Um, if we also look at the refractive indices, uh, it also explains why uh, the cornea and aqueous interface actually produces or contributes a little bit of negative power uh, to the system. The innervation of the cornea um, uh, is actually quite exquisite. Um, the density of nerve endings uh, is many times greater than that of the skin. Um, and that explains uh, why the cornea or the normal cornea is so sensitive. Um, these nerves actually come uh, from 
as branches of the ciliary nerves, which is a branch of uh, the trigeminal. Uh, the long ciliary nerves that come in uh, actually form a perilimbal nerve ring, and then branches from this nerve ring uh, course radially towards the center, and then also anteriorly, uh, and end up forming a subepithelial plexus. Um, that subepithelial location explains why uh, anything like a corneal abrasion, uh, which ex which gets rid of the normal epithelium and exposes these uh, nerve endings, are extremely painful. These nerves are mostly unmyelinated uh, and lose their myelin once they enter the corneal stroma. Uh, along with the sensory branches, you also have some sympathetic and parasympathetic fibers mixed in. So, uh, the normal cornea is avascular, but it needs to uh, get its oxygen uh, and its glucose and other nutrients somehow. And uh, so, glucose uh, actually diffuses through the aqueous primarily, whereas oxygen diffuses primarily through the tear film. Um, so if you have a tight-fitting contact lens, uh, you can actually have poor diffusion uh, through the contacts. Uh, this is the same if you have a, a contact with a low diffusion coefficient. Uh, and the hypoxia can actually um, cause changes in the cornea, such as edema, which we'll talk about later. Uh, the metabolism actually shifts more from an anaerobic state, uh, sorry, from an aerobic state to an anaerobic state whenever you have um, blockage of that, um, that oxygen from the outside. Uh, and so even at night with, uh, with the eyelids closed, um, you would shift your metabolism more towards an anaerobic state since oxygen is not as readily available. The tear film itself has several functions. Um, so one of them the most important dehydration. Uh, and both of those actually help maintain the, the clarity of the cornea uh, so that we can have such good visual acuity. Uh, the tear film also contains uh, numerous different factors, uh, specifically uh, immunoglobulins. Uh, those are the IgA and the IgG. Uh, if you'll recall, uh, IgA is actually your secretory uh, immunoglobulin, and so is, that is uh, secreted by the glands, uh, by your lacrimal glands, uh, and ends up in the tear film and plays an important immune function. You also have various factors such as lactoferrin and lysozyme. Uh, lactoferrin is a, a substance that helps sequester iron, uh, which uh, basically the bacteria need. And so without that iron, it, it provides an environment that's not as conducive to bacterial growth. And lysozyme also helps, uh, you know, uh, destroy uh, the bacteria that might be within the tear film. So we can look at the different layers of the tear film. Uh, there are three primary layers. Uh, moving from anterior to posterior, the first is the lipid layer. Uh, the lipid layer is on the very outside and it's formed by uh, these lipid producing glands or sebaceous glands, uh, including your meibomian glands, uh, as well as your glands of Zeiss. And uh, this lipid layer actually uh, performs an important function in uh, protecting the aqueous layer. Uh, and it basically protects it from evaporation. Uh, if the lipid layer isn't healthy, then the, uh, the tears can tend to evaporate more quickly. Clinically, uh, we can measure that at the tear breakup time, where you uh, instill some fluorescein into the eye uh, and have the patient um, basically Try to keep the eyes open without blinking, and you count the number of seconds 
so that you see the tear film start to break up. Uh, we say that uh, tear breakup time less than 10 seconds is abnormal. The second layer of the tear film is the aqueous layer, uh, and that's the layer that provides most of the lubrication of the cornea. Uh, it also contains all the different factors that we talked about, uh, and uh, including the, uh, the immune factors as well as the nutrients. Uh, and that's formed by the main lacrimal gland and the accessory lacrimal glands, the accessory glands being uh, glands of Krauss and Wilfram. Then we have the mucinous layer of the tear film, uh, and that is formed by epithelial cells and goblet cells. Uh, that helps stabilize the tear film uh, over the corneous, corneal surface, uh, and it basically provides uh, a smooth interface between the rest of the tear film and the epithelial surface. Uh, this slide is uh, a little bit more detailed. Uh, discusses the different layers of the tear film, uh, where they come from, all the different components that make it make that specific layer up, and, and its uh, physiological functions. And this slide it is pretty detailed, and it's basically here for your reference if you'd like to read a little bit more in depth about uh, the different properties of the tear film. And so this is an overview of the histology of the normal cornea. Uh, we move uh, from anterior to posterior again. Uh, number one, we have the epithelium. Uh, number two, we have the epithelial basement membrane. Number three, we have Bowman's layer. Number four, we have the corneal stroma, which makes up the majority of thickness of the cornea. Uh, number five is decimase membrane. And six is the uh, endothelium. And so in the next few slides, we'll be discussing uh, all these layers a little bit more in depth. Uh, so the epithelium basically uh, forms the ocular surface uh, along with the conjunctival epithelium as well. Uh, the corneal epithelium is non keratinized uh, and it's stratified stratified squamous epithelial cells. Uh, it's made up of several layers and uh, it totals approximately 50 microns thick. So it's about five to six layers thick uh, altogether and it's made up of several different types of cells. It has superficial cells, wing cells, and then basal cells. The basal cells being the cells that actually proliferate and adhere to Bowman's layer. And so, as these basal cells proliferate, uh, differentiation actually occurs, and they, they move more anteriorly, uh, transforming into your wing cells, and then ultimately into the superficial cells, which form the very anterior aspect of the cornea. Down towards the bottom here, we can see several pictures. Uh, these are actually confocal images uh, that provide kind of a histologic view of the cornea without having to do any kind of biopsy. And it's a useful tool uh, to look at the morphology of the cells and any potential pathology that might be there. And so this just shows several different layers uh, of these uh, epithelial cells. The primary function of the corneal epithelium is uh, as a barrier to the outside, uh, to the ocular surface. And it does this primarily with junctional complexes, uh, which prevent the passage of materials into deeper layers of the cornea. Uh, it consists of tight junctions, or zonula occludens, uh, which occur between the superficial cells. Hemidesmosomes, or zonula adherens, uh, and also desmosomes. Desmosomes are, are present in all layers of the uh, corneal epithelium. And, and then, of course, gap junctions, which are uh, structures that allow materials to pass between the cells and allow the cells to communicate with each other. Um, these gap junctions are only present in the wing cells and the basal cells of the epithelium. 
So superficial cells are non-keratinized except uh, when we have pathologic conditions. Uh, and the surface or the anterior surface of the epithelium is covered with microvilli, uh, which help increase the surface area. These microvilli are covered with glycoproteins and gly glycolipids that form a structure called a glycocalyx. Uh, and this structure is actually what gives it uh, the cornea, it's hydrophilic properties to the epithelium. And that's what interacts with the mucinous layer, as we mentioned before, uh, to stabilize the tear film and provide a smooth surface. The junctional complexes, uh, which actually aid to the barrier function. And then uh, the deepest layer of the corneal epithelium is the basal cells. Uh, this is a single layer of columnar cells which possess mitotic activity, and they adhere to the basement membrane by hemidesmosomes. So as the basal cells uh, proliferate and uh, differentiate, uh, we talk about this migration pattern uh, in an XYZ axis. Uh, and basically that means uh, that when you have your epithelial cells that start uh, or your stem cells that come from the uh, liberal palisades of vote, um, they have several different directions that they migrate. So they migrate centripetally, meaning that they uh, move towards the center. Uh, and that they actually move anteriorly as well. And so that's sort of the X, Y, Z. Uh, these cells kind of move in all, uh, all three axes as they differentiate and move towards the surface. Uh, below you can see uh, just some pictures, examples of uh, sort of a whorl or vortex keratopathy. Uh, and that actually highlights uh, the movement towards uh, the movement of the epithelium cells uh, themselves towards the center, uh, as you can see in the pattern. So the uh, epithelial basement membrane uh, is just below the, the basal cells. It's about 40 to 60 nanometers thick. And when you look at the ultrastructure uh, by electron microscopy, it actually has two different layers called the lamina lucida and the lamina densa. And uh, that's all we'll mention. We won't go into more in depth about that. Um, the basement membrane is primarily type 4 collagen as well as a structure called laminin. So now that we've talked about the corneal epithelium and the corneal basement membrane, um, now would be a good time to talk about corneal staining. So there's three primary stains that we use to examine the cornea. Uh, you have your standard fluorescein, uh, as well as things like rose bengal and lysamine green. Now I, I actually group this uh, with fluorescein separate from rose bengal and lysamine green. And that's because fluorescein has actually a different method of staining uh, than the other two. Uh, fluorescein actually adheres to epithelial basement membrane. And so anywhere that the epithelium has been removed, uh, either uh, mechanically like a corneal abrasion, or if those cells have just died and sloughed off, uh, the fluorescein will bind to those areas uh, because it binds to the uh, epithelial basement membrane. Um, Rose Bengal and lysamine green actually uh, will highlight different areas. Um, and they will actually uh, bind to corneal epithelial cells that are sort of devitalized and not as healthy uh, as your normal epithelial cell. Uh, and then uh, it will also bind to areas that have lost the protective mucus covering. Um, so below here we can actually see some pictures that uh, show the differences in these stains. Uh, on the very left here, you can see uh, sort of a severe uh, 
um, uh, confluence of punctate epithelial erosions that you would commonly see uh, in uh, keratoconjunctivitis sicca uh, or various levels of dry eye. And so the fact that it stains with fluorescein means that uh, the epithelial cells have been damaged to the point where the basement membrane is exposed. Uh, in the middle here, the middle lower picture, you can see uh, some staining with lysamine green. And you can see that this actually stains the conjunctiva more readily than fluorescein would. And the reason is because, uh, again, these areas have uh, uh, sort of have an earlier form of dry eye uh, where they've pr uh, lost the protective mucus coating. Uh, and so now these areas are starting to pick up the stain. Uh, in the middle upper photo, uh, these are actually filaments that are uh, staining with rosemary gall. And then the pictures to the right uh, sort of show the difference between uh, your typical uh, dendrite in uh, HSV keratitis. Uh, and the bottom shows your pseudodendrite of uh, herpes zoster keratitis. And uh, the above picture actually just has fluorescein staining. And so you can see the central dendrite itself uh, picks up the fluorescein quite nicely. Uh, if you are able to actually stain with both, both fluorescein and rose bengal, you would see that the rose bengal uh, picks up the stain along the edges of the dendrite. And that's because uh, at the very edges, uh, these are the devitalized cells. Uh, and so you would uh, kind of see the classic picture of a dendrite where the central dendrite uh, stains with fluorescein and then the very outer border of the dendrite would stain with rose bengal. And below you can see uh, more of, uh, I, I guess, a pseudodendrite where it picks up rose bengal more readily than it would fluorescein. Uh, and that's because the pseudodendrites uh, are not true epithelial defects. So next in the cornea is Bowman's layer, and that's uh, immediately beneath the corneal epithelium. Bowman's layer is acellular. Uh, it's about 12 microns thick, made up of collagen fibers, primarily types 1 and 3, and various proteoglycans. Uh, and it's important to note that Bowman's layer is not a true basement membrane. Uh, we saw that the epithelium has its own basement membrane. And so that's why we refer to Bowman's layer as opposed to Bowman's membrane. And that's an important concept and sometimes a testable concept as well. The corneal stroma uh, is what makes up the bulk of the corneal thickness, uh, about 90% of the total thickness of the cornea. Uh, it has a water content by weight of uh, precisely 78% in the normal cornea. Uh, and that's an important number to remember. Uh, for whatever reason, people that make up uh, these sometimes board exams uh, like to mention that number uh, as a, a specific number. So try to remember that number. Um, the strength, shape, and the clarity of the cornea is largely determined by the stroma. Uh, the clarity actually changes uh, if you move away from this uh, water content. So if, if you have more water content, such as you would see with corneal edema, uh, or if the cornea actually begins to dehydrate a little bit, um, you would have corneal opacities. The cells that make up the corneal stroma are called keratocytes, and these are also connected by gap junctions. Keratocytes are typically quiescent in the normal cornea, but then when they have some sort of injury, they can transform into what we call myofibroblasts, which produce the extracellular matrix of the protein uh, of the stroma, uh, as well as matrix metalloproteinases and other collagen degrading enzymes. And all of these substances are important when we talk about corneal remodeling. So when you have an injury to the cornea, 
uh, it's important that the shroom is able to remodel itself uh, to uh, assist with the repair process. Uh, however, these substances can also be uh, uh, damaging to the corneal stroma. Uh, when we talk about various types of infections, such as a, a uh, bacterial keratitis, uh, say caused by Pseudomonas, uh, some of these bacteria will actually activate these substances, and those will contribute to things like corneal perforation. So that can actually be a bad thing. Um, the keratocytes in the normal cornea uh, can actually take two to three years for cell turnover. Uh, and so when we're looking at a, a cornea that has undergone damage, um, you can see that these cells will actually turn over uh, relatively slowly, so you may not see uh, changes in the cornea very rapidly. Uh, when we talk about the types of collagen uh, which make up the corneal stroma, the collagen itself makes up uh, a little more than 70% of the dry weight of the cornea. Uh, it's mostly type 1 collagen, but also has contributions of type 3, type 4, I'm sorry, type 3, type 5, and type 6 uh, within the corneal stroma. Uh, the, fi the collagen fibers uh, within the stroma are arranged homogeneously, which contributes to its clarity. And any type of fibrosis or edema uh, basically creates uh, heterogeneity within the stroma, uh, which is what actually causes the opacity. Uh, if we look at the uh, scleral stroma, uh, you can see that the sclera itself is a lot more opaque than the cornea is. Uh, however, um, the makeup, the actual makeup of the uh, sclera is actually not too different from the, uh, uh, I guess, the corneal stroma. Yes, the sclera, which uh, contributes to it, op its opacity. Uh, the stroma also contains proteoglycans, uh, which help form the matrix between uh, the different collagen fibers. It also contains uh, various proteins and gly glycosaminoglycans, such as keratin sulfate, chondroitin sulfate, and dermatin sulfate. And it's uh, basically the interactions between these molecules uh, which is responsible for the tendency of the cornea to, uh, to actually swell or its swelling pressure, uh, sort of as a natural tendency when exposed to uh, the aqueous fluid. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about why we don't have a constantly uh, swollen cornea uh, a little bit later when we discuss the endothelium. So after the stroma, uh, we used to think that decimase membrane was the next deeper layer. And uh, some recent ev uh, evidence has come out to suggest the possibility of a new layer uh, posterior to the corneal stroma. Uh, and so uh, this was actually discovered relatively recently. Uh, it was published in Ophthalmology in 2013. Uh, and it's basically a pre-decimase layer, or do with layer. And so uh, it was first described in 2013. And basically it, uh, it was discovered as a result of the new uh, big bubble technique of uh, creating a deep anterior lunar keratoplasty. And during that process, you actually inject air into the corneal stroma to se separate decimase membrane from the rest of the stroma in order to get the deepest possible dissection. Um, however, Dua did several uh, experiments where he uh, removed the uh, decimase layer and discovered that the big bubble actually remained intact. And so the fact that the big bubble was still there uh, despite the absence of decimase suggested that there was another layer present. And, uh, 
And so this is what we now call the predestinase layer. Uh, the histology is actually primarily type 1 collagen. Uh, but in contrast to the rest of the corneal stroma, it may have more contribution of type 4 and type, type 6 collagen. Uh, it's also been determined that uh, the predecimase layer may have more tightly packed collagen fibrils uh, within this layer than the normal stroma. So now we come to decimase membrane. Uh, and it, it is a true basement membrane, and it's the basement membrane of the corneal endothelium. Uh, it actually grows throughout, birth, uh, throughout life um, and is about 3 microns at birth, and by adulthood it reaches a thickness of 8 to 10 microns. Uh, it consists of an anterior non-banded layer, as well as the posterior banded layer. And the banded layer is the layer that actually is responsible for the growth uh, throughout life. And decimase membrane is type 4 as well as uh, type 8 collagen. And a rupture in uh, decimase membrane actually results in acute corneal edema, uh, such as you might see in uh, damage due to birth trauma uh, or acute hydrops in keratoconus. And so that highlights uh, sort of this barrier function that decimase membrane also provides uh, in preventing fluid from uh, accumulating within the corneal stroma. Next is the endothelium. Uh, and the endothelium is a single layer of cells which is posterior to decimase membrane. And the normal cells actually have several important characteristics to them. Uh, they're all pretty much the same shape, and it's a hexagonal shape. Uh, all the cells should have about the same area. And uh, it also has a, a density, uh, which actually is highest uh, at a younger age, uh, and actually decreases throughout life. So the bottom picture here is another confocal image. Uh, of the corneal endothelium. And you can actually see uh, sort of this hexagonal shape in that most of these cells have six sides to them. Uh, when you have damage to the endothelium, these characteristics will actually change. And so uh, after damage, these endothelial cells do not regenerate. Uh, the remaining endothelial cells actually uh, increase in size and change their shape to help cover the damaged areas. And so that results in uh, a variable cell area called polymegaphism. And then a decreased number of cells that actually have your typical hexagonal shape, and we call that pleomorphism. You'll also have a smaller density of cells. Um, and all of these uh, characteristics can actually be measured with specular microscopy. Uh, and uh, when you're looking at with a specular microscope, uh, the, uh, the machine will actually kind of report all these different characteristics. And you can use these to determine how much damage has actually been caused to the, the endothelium. So like we mentioned before, uh, the corneal endothelium uh, has a primary barrier function uh, and helps prevent the aqueous humor from reaching the corneal stroma. Uh, and these are uh, basically formed by junctional complexes. Uh, but they also perform uh, an important role in uh, pumping fluid out of the cornea. And uh, that's basically uh, from sodium potassium ATPase pumps. And so there's an osmotic gradient within the, the cornea that basically results in sodium moving uh, into the corneal stroma and potassium moving in the opposite direction. And so it requires a sodium-potassium ATPase pump to maintain this gradient, uh, along with a sodium-hydrogen uh, ion uh, pump 
and these are both expressed in the basal lateral membrane of the endothelial cells. Uh, along with these pumps, uh, a reaction with uh, carbonic anhydrase uh, actually moves bicar bicarbonate and water into the aqueous. Uh, and so all of these actions help uh, dehydrate the cornea and maintain a specific water content. Uh, this has several clinically relevant functions. Uh, the primary one being the corneal clarity, as we discussed before. Uh, another important one is actually when you're performing uh, LASIK. You, you cut the flap, perform your treatment, and put the flap on. And what you may have noticed is that uh, it only takes a few minutes before the, the flap actually sort of adheres to the rest of the cornea, and it becomes difficult uh, to move around. Uh, and that's basically because of uh, the negative pressure that results within the corneal stroma. Uh, and that negative pressure uh, is caused by this action of the endothelial pumps. And so that's uh, sort of another clinically relevant situation where you, you directly see the action of the, the endothelial pumps. So now we've gone through all the different layers of the cornea. Um, I just wanted to touch on a few high yield points uh, that are important when we talk about the cornea. Uh, these are uh, some sometimes clinically relevant, and sometimes uh, they also show up on uh, your various board exams. Uh, so these are your more testable facts. So remember the normal corneal size in adults, uh, and remember that it's slightly longer horizontally than it is vertically. Uh, know that the central corneal thickness is on average about uh, 540 microns. Uh, like we talked about before, the uh, normal hydration content of the cornea is important. So remember 78%. Uh, from a refractive standpoint, uh, it makes up two-thirds of the refractive power of the eye, and that power is actually at the air tear film junction. Make sure you know uh, which glands actually uh, produce the different tear layers. Know which immunoglobulins are found in the normal tear film. And remember that it's primarily IgA, which is your secretory component. Uh, remember that decimase membrane is a true basement membrane, while Bowman's layer is not. And that reflects the actual names of the, the structures. Uh, know about all the different types of junctional complexes uh, within the cornea and how they contribute to the barrier function. Uh, basically, be aware of the, uh, the way that the stem cells uh, come from the, uh, the limbus uh, and then migrate towards the center as well as anteriorly. Uh, know about the corneal endothelium and uh, the physiologic mechanism that it uh, has to pump water out of the corneal stroma. And then also uh, make sure that you review the different types of collagen within each layer. Uh, it's one of the things that tends to show up on exams, so make sure you review this as well. And so these are my references. Uh, that concludes the lecture. Uh, and I hope you learned some important points uh, with the uh, cornea and its various layers. And that concludes.